I'm here today with Patrick Reyes. Patrick is Senior Director of Learning Design at the Forum for Theological Exploration. He holds a PhD from Claremont School of Theology and is the author of a book called Nobody Cries When We Die, God, Community, and Surviving to Adulthood. He's also the author of a new book just coming out called The Purpose Gap, Empowering Communities of Color to Find Meaning and Thrive. So Patrick, thanks so much for joining us today. Oh, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here with you. So if you could, before we dive into the book, uh, tell us more about your background and the work that you do at the uh, Forum for Theological Exploration. Yeah, the way I've been introducing myself these days is I am sitting between five generations of Carmelitas. We, um, my, you know, going back into our history, there's a Carmelita. My grandmother's name was uh, Carmelita. My daughter's name is Carmelita. And I'm sure there'll be someone carrying on the spirit of her <laughs> in five generations. And um, at FTE, um, I, I'm the senior director of learning design, which essentially is means a lot and nothing at the same time. I'm in charge of our grants and fellowships to support the next generation of Christian leaders for the church and the academy. I also produce all of our resources, online learning materials that you can check out at ftleaders.org um, and manage and work with some of the best humans uh, on this planet. So um, yeah, I, I do a lot and it's, it's just, it's a joy and privilege to help this next generation find the resources they need. Well, that's really cool. And I can see where that would really keep you busy with that much responsibility and scope. Where, where is FTE located? We are in Decatur, Georgia. So we have been in the news for the last couple months, <laughs> you know, with <laughs> all the political, reasons. all the, all the uh, stuff that's going on with Georgia. And actually, you know, um, it's just been fantastic as a Chicano myself, who's been in California or my family's been in California, Mexico for several hundred years, um, being in the South um, and kind of navigating, what does it mean to bring up another cohort, another generation of leaders in a context that's not necessarily home for me has been really fun and energizing because there's so much work and, and so much to learn um, from being kind of out of my own context. Interesting. Yeah, I, I can clearly see that that would be uh, interesting. <laughs> so um, before we get into the new book, tell us a little bit about the previous book that you wrote. Yeah, the previous book was written um, about my own sort of sense of vocation and call. Um, actually, it was written prior to me coming to FTE, and it's really me trying to make sense as a Chicano, as a Mexican-American, as uh, you know, a young person, how vocation, meaning, and purpose kind of could be interpreted a little bit differently from my lens, which is if vocation is a call, it's about a call to life for me, a call to survive, a call to just breathe. And so I felt like that was missing in all the stuff I had read um, in all of my education um, and thought that, hey, for some of us, some of those communities that are really struggling, just breathing, just making it to tomorrow is sometimes enough. And sometimes that's what God calls us precisely to be. So that's what Nobody Cries was really about, it was about making it to tomorrow um, and being called to life. And so how about the new book? How did it come about? Yeah, the new book was a kind of a play on that. If that first book was really about my own sort of sense of vocation, my own sort of spiritual autobiography, kind of teasing all this literature together, the purpose gap is really about how do we shift the narrative away from I, like my story, uh, my sense of call to a communal sense of call. Now, I'm not the only one. We're not trying to make exceptions here. Um, some of the ways I've put it in the book is, you know, what about... Not, it's not good enough to be the first to make it out, to get an education, to, to make it, as I said in Nobody Cries. The purpose gap is about making sure I'm not the last um, to bring a whole community along. So it's, the purpose gap is really to uncover how do we build the practices to bring our communities along? How do we celebrate constellations as opposed to individual stars? Um, that's really what the purpose gap is all about. So uh, I deal with so many different authors, and um, one of the real challenges is getting a book deal. So can you tell us a little bit about how this book deal came about? Yeah, you know, one of my uh, favorite moments ever um, that I've had with my father was actually where this book started. I was at the Hispanic Theological Initiative in Princeton, New Jersey. My dad, who um, he's left California before, but never really come out and see me do anything. And I was given a book lecture on the first on the first book, um, and he's sitting there next to uh, WJK's executive editor, 
<laughs> um, Bob Radcliffe, who is just an amazing human in general. And I gave this and Bob had uh, approached me after. And so it's really cool to have your father who, um, you know, he paved the way before me sitting next to my eventual publisher. So that way, whatever I said in that moment about what this project was eventually going to be, because that's what I was kind of talking about at that moment um, in that lecture, uh, my dad was going to correct instantly. <laughs> and he did. So it was a really fun way to, to tease out this relationship. And in this moment, if I'm going to tell stories from my community, it was good to have my dad who made, yeah, honestly, just, I wouldn't be here without him to be able to say, wait, 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 hold on. When he was telling that story, let me tell you from dad's perspective, what was going down. Oh, that's classic. Wow. Uh, that had to be a little uncomfortable. I can imagine. <laughs> it was fun. You know, he, you know, my dad can correct me anytime he wants. <laughs> Wow. Well, that's, I mean, isn't it amazing how relationships, you know, drive so much of what gets done? Absolutely. And, you know, one of the things I loved about writing this book was it, it was a deeper dive on what are the conditions that face um, people of color in the United States in particular that have kind of uh, limited the access to resources. And I look at someone like my dad who uh, overcame so many more obstacles. I mean, I overcame a lot, but he overcame, you know, times it by 10. And the amount of work that our elders and ancestors have done in order for us to make it here, it was just, it, it, this book was such an honor and a privilege to write down those sacrifices, those things that they did. So that way the whole community could be brought along in a little bit better way. So could you tell us a little bit about how the book's organized or the different sections of it? Yeah, I got three major sections in the book. The first is why. We got to understand why the purpose gap exists. You know, like the housing gap, like the education gap, um, the purpose gap is really to take our history serious and look at and kind of uncover the ways that colonialism, slavery, um, his, you know, systemic injustice, injustice across this country have kind of limited access of resources to communities of color. So we take that serious. The second section really goes, okay, if this is true, if this is true, the purpose gap is real. If our lives have been so uh, stymied, and what does that mean? How do we make our way out of it? It's a it's a question of how. What do we do with this, um, and to discern another way? And that's when I'm I'm really sort of uh, asking the question: How do we build constellations, not stars? I don't want to be the exception to the rule, the one Latino that made it out of an education desert. I want my whole community to come along. So how do we do that work? And then the last section is, I'm not the first to say this or to do this work. So the last section is to really honor the legacies of those people who have um, built and fostered this sense of community in a way it's been really powerful. So lifting up uh, folks like Marion Wright Edelman at the Children's Defense Fund, or uh, my good friend, Bell Reyes, who's out at the Innovation Bridge, connecting communities and higher education to make sure Latinos have an access to the education pipeline in a way out of their communities or a way to uh, empower their communities to transform and see the value in our histories and our narratives. So uh, those are the three kind of major moves. And the hope is, is that by the time you get to the end of the book, I mean, there's little reflection and questions for you to go through as a community is that you'll understand not only how the purpose gap is impacting your community, but what are some tools and mechanisms that you can use and leverage within your communities so that way the next generation can truly thrive? How do you make you know, space for them um, to do the work that they feel called to do? Well, that's really excellent. I mean, any book that you know I read, I always look for, okay, what do we do about it? Yep. Right. You know, so, so tell us, you know, some of the practical things that you're suggesting. Yeah. The first thing, if we're, you know, it's in the same thing in sort of in sections. And that first one is to take the history serious in our local communities. You know, we can map the way the purpose gap has um, kind of emerged. So in these things, if we take the totalities of the housing, um, housing gap or the education gap or the wealth gap, and we looked at the historic kind of systemic uh, process that has undergird, the, undergird those gaps and we account for them. What does that look like in our community? So, you know, my favorite, one of my favorite examples is commutes. You know, what is the commute that we actually have? I mean, you could take that literally. So communities of color, there's a lot of research to show communities of color have to commute longer to their jobs 
then why folks? So what does that mean if I lose an hour each way every day? Um, as I talk about, my dad did in a little Daihatsu you know, car that had like 50 horsepower. I still don't even know why he did it, um, you know, sacrificing his life. But if we kind of took on this to under to really kind of investigate what are the things that cause the gap? And I say that that's more than just literal. For me, it's also a cultural commute. You know, communities of color have to travel to majority cultures in the way that we speak, in the way that we act and the way that we navigate the systems of power. So what is the toll that that takes on our community? So it's really about these practices are meant to lift up and say, oh, hold up, these things are not cool and we gotta do something about it. And that turns us to those practices of, you know, what are the ways that we can actually litigate in some cases? When can we build programs? When can we do advocacy? Um, when can we just imagine our budgets differently? I mean, it, it really is a full suite of practices to think through how do we address those, uh, those original gaps that we've identified and their root causes. Mm, wow. And so who do you see as the main target audience for the book? I've, I've said educators and elders, anyone who's shepherding this next generation. I, I'm, I am very um, conscious of the fact that when I was writing, this book isn't for the for the self-help folks who just want to be the best version of themselves. You know, there's plenty of literature that's out there for you. This is for those leaders who are more committed to the next generation thriving than their own thriving. Cool. And so I see that as educators, pastors, leaders, those folks who are actually in charge of clearing the conditions um, so that our children may thrive. Wow. And so the book is coming out in March. Um, what other plans do you have associated with the launch? Yeah, so we do a lot. I mean, part of the um, is to connect with some of our work at FTE, which is creating conditions for the next generation of pastoral leaders and educators of color. Um, you know, of course, like any author, I got a couple of speaking engagements, but my, my biggest hope is that for the communities that I lift up in that last section, um, that we're able to actually leverage some of those practices or we'll have some, you know, key learnings from the ways these practices have been leveraged in communities that we'll be able to highlight to drive more resources to the folks who are actually making a difference on the ground. You know, I think about in this moment in the pandemic that uh, we just had, you know, the, in California, there was a fire, there's COVID-19 and there's racism, anti-immigration. And the, my community is out there picking the food that goes on all of our tables that we're, most of us are ordering from the comfort of our own homes. Um, and I think about how do we disrupt that? My hope is that some of the folks who've been engaged in some of the writing and some of the now reading of this book will be so moved to kind of change their policies and practices, put essential workers, folks who are on the line uh, first. Yeah. Wow. Well, we've got a long ways to go, right? I mean, you just, just highlighted about, you know, a half dozen serious divides, uh, serious issues that we've got and, uh, and none of them are easy to deal with, but um, there seems to be, an increasing momentum toward actually trying to deal with many of them, which is encouraging. That's right. So um, I know you're in the midst of just introducing this book, but have you thought more about future books? Yeah, I don't know if I have another one of these books in me. <laughs> I, I love the writing about uh, vocation, meaning, and purpose. There's definitely, uh, there's more need for more stories like the ones I tell in this book. Um, from communities of color because there's a broader diversity um, just with even within the own, my own Latino community of stories that need to be told. But I will say this, that uh, some of my writing, you know, some of the uh, pieces that I picked up on here is also coming from the humanities, from literature. And I think of someone like Octavia Butler, Rudolfo Anaya, who are writing uh, fictions and drawing out kind of more, I say concretely, I know they're in the imagination because they're fiction, but trying to imagine those better worlds, there's definitely, there's an un, the last piece that wasn't addressed in a way that I wanted to out of the purpose gap was to further imagine what does a world of thriving look like? I want to see a world that my, you know, in those five generations, when that Carmelita who's carrying on the card, you know, the spirit of Carmelita is living and walking on this planet. What does it look like when we've addressed climate change? What does it look like when we've brought, 
equity and access to a broader uh, group of people? What does it look like for her to truly thrive when she probably won't even know who the heck I am? She probably won't even know my name. I think there's some imagining, some futuristic imagining that we have to do collectively and writing to do, and I'd love to be a part of that. Very cool. Very cool. So, you know, now that you've written a couple of books, what advice do you have for people that are a little bit earlier stage? Right, 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 right. <laughs> you know, like I, you know, I don't know why this is, I get this question a lot. I work with scholars of color who are in the kind of um, doctoral process where they're investigating and writing. And there is, um, there is this sort of sense that, yeah, I have to have, I have to be told by someone else to write down my thoughts or say that my book is worth publishing. And one of the things I say is that I just think everyone has a book in them, at least one. Most people have like 10 books in them. <laughs> the difference between a writer and a non-writer is that they write. And so sit down, write the book. It's going to find an audience. It's going to find a publisher, but you got to have the, you got to do the, do the work, put in the work and write and not worry so much about um, the politics of writing. That's what you and I get to do, uh, Brian, is, is work around all the politics and make the conditions right. So when people do have their books ready to go, um, that there, there's a publishing pipeline for them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, again, the, the name of uh, Patrick's new book is The Purpose Gap, Empowering Communities of Color to Find Meaning and Thrive. It's coming out from Westminster John Knox Press. Uh, what is the actual release date? March 16th. March 16th. All right. Well, congratulations, Patrick. Thanks so much for, for doing this great work and uh, best of luck uh, in, in the rollout. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks so much.